Hi everyone, Magda from Coacharia here. Uh, welcome to our next Wonder Woman Wednesdays, or Wednesday, um, as the case may be, where we get to meet some amazing woman from somewhere in the world and get to learn about her journey in life and work, etc. And we learn how her amazingness, wonderfulness, makes the world a little better every day. So today with me is Nobantu Mpotulo, who is joining you from South Africa. But I don't actually know what city. Are you in Pretoria or Joburg? Yes, I'm in Pretoria. How did okay. you guess? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I saw on your LinkedIn that you teach at uh, a, a university in Johannesburg, but I wasn't sure where you were. Never been to Pretoria, but I hear you have good jacarandas going. Yes, beautiful jacaranda trees. Ah, my favorite memories of South Africa are when the petals are falling and it looks like purple snow. So pretty. I know, especially on the, on the bonnets of cars and you have these white cars that have got all these purple petals. How beautiful. Oh, so beautiful. Um, Nobantu, I am very excited to be connected with you. I only learned about you maybe a month ago when you joined Kocharia for um, a demonstration of Ubuntu coaching. And I thought that was already fascinating enough. Ubuntu is one of my favorite concepts, which I learned in 2005 and ever since, like it's, it just makes sense. Um, so maybe I'll ask you about that if you want to talk about it. But anyway, long story short, um, you're fascinating in terms of just your energy and how you, I don't know, like when I was watching you coach, it felt like you're this calming presence, but you're also able to get the right things out of people, which is pretty cool for a coach slash a human being. Um, and then... Uh, Cindy, who is at Kocharia, she's our learning director, told me about a bit about your background and wow, it definitely makes sense to have you interviewed as a Wonder Woman because you clearly are. So welcome. So um, Nobantu, I learned of you as a coach and I've seen you as a coach, but that's just one aspect of you. So I would love to start, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, I'd love to hear your background. How did you grow up? And tell us the whole story of, you know, what, what got you to where you are today? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, that's a question that is very close to my heart. And you mentioned one of the ancient African wisdom, Ubuntu. I grew up in a, an environment where Ubuntu was alive. And this is um, a way of life that we grew up as, as younger people, younger girls, a young woman. And what this did to me was to help me to be able to see people and to be able to be curious of other people and to always want to connect and stay in relationship with others. And this taught me how important and big the we is more than the I is. If I'm thinking of uh, where I started, how I even came to be a coach. It's an amazing story that my brother would not like very much. Uh -oh. uh, I've <laughs> then I want to hear it all the more. <laughs> three brothers who are older than me and I'm the youngest and the only girl. And in my family, we are people who are, I would say, fortunate to be uh, very gifted as far as maths and science is concerned. So my brothers followed the math science field. And when I was doing my final year at high school, uh, the second eldest brother came and made sure that he wanted me to pass maths with an A 
and also go to university, follow medicine science field. And I thought, mm -mm, that ain't me. <laughs> That's not the field for me. And uh, then I was 16 years. And I thought, okay, oh, my brother from his good heart is doing everything to make sure that the last born of the family is going to be another med something or science or engineering something. And yet I knew that my wish and my aspiration was to work with people. So what I did then, because I, I could not get myself not to pass, but I just said, maybe I won't go for the A, I will pass maths so that I don't go for, for the science field. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, the results came, I got to see, and uh, here <laughs> I am. I went to university and did my psychology, and oh my gosh, I was so happy. <laughs> I told my brother when now I had finished my uh, first degree, and he was like, oh gosh, <laughs> you are so funny and so cunning. So I found myself, somehow I did develop quite a focused mind and a mind that knew what it wanted from a, a very young age. I have not really been experienced or influenced by peer pressure. I always went with my heart, with my body. And from a young age, I would say I've been very intuitive because I am one who listens to the body and the body is my teacher and my guide. And that's where the truth is, it never lies. Mm. That's incredibly aware for, like you said, a person so young. Um, is that, how did you develop that, that awareness and that trust in your, in your body? I think for me, I was fortunate growing up because I'm told when I was two, three, four years old, I knew exactly what I wanted and uh, would not be convinced that much and uh, would go with what I believed in. And I always believed that whatever you do, you sit with whatever consequences. So in a way that helped to develop not fearing venturing into the unknown and it made me to be curious about things that were not part of my life and listening to this body so i wouldn't know whether then i was even aware all i knew was the spontaneity and uh, going for what i want standing for my truth and being courageous so I, I have to ask, because you grew up in South Africa during apartheid, and I can't even imagine what that must have been like. And to be someone who is courageous and who is standing up for her truth, um, that must have, that's already a pretty big deal, you know, back then. But I'm guessing apartheid made things uh, a lot more complicated. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, it was a complicated uh, period. And uh, when I really became aware of what was happening, it was quite early in my life because I grew up from a family of activists, political activists. The first born at home, the eldest, was at university then. And uh, he was in med school and Every time when he came back during a school vacation periods, he would uh, educate us about life, about the suffering in the world. And uh, he would take the whole family and uh, some kids in the neighborhood. We would hike. And when we complained, he would tell us what we're complaining about because kids in India are suffering. So he taught me uh, poems that really showed how important it is to be who you are, no matter what happens. And uh, one poem he taught me when I was seven, it's uh, uh, the poem around 
Africanness around being black and um, I'm proud and I'm, I'm black. So I grew up not taking the way I was growing up in South Africa with not being recognized as uh, equal to some races as diminishing because I grew up in a home that really was conscientious in terms of politics, in terms of inequality, in terms of knowing and wanting the children to strive for equitable kind of way of life. And it uh, apartheid uh, affected me personally because unfortunately my brother who was uh, in med school left the country, went to exile in his early 20s and unfortunately uh, he disappeared, we never knew what happened to him. There are rumors that he was killed by the South African government. And I remember at uh, a rare age of 17, when I was at university, when there was student unrest, they used to call the army on us. And uh, I mean, being little girls and uh, young students, we would be beaten and we would be tortured by that. So that was a very painful history. I, yeah, like I said, I can't even imagine. I, I've heard stories of my, from my parents, um, not of apartheid, but of growing up in Poland during communism. So I, I was born in 1980 and apparently was during uh, martial law. And um, yeah, it's just the stories that um, you hear it's so hard to connect to now because we complain about little things. Um, just sure. you have to put it in perspective as to what others go through. So I'm sorry to hear about your brother. Um, that, that sucks to say the least. Um, but you know, what occurs to me is uh, given ha going through that uh, situation and growing up in that and the family impact, but also having an activist family what i found fascinating was i was when i was googling you uh there's a retreat website where uh it it talks about a quote from victor frankl that um you like and uh it says between stimulus and response there is a space in that space that's is our power my favorite to choose our, our response <laughs> yeah and our response lies our growth and our freedom and i love that quote um but what's kind of crazy to me is how are you able to live in that space and not just want to go crazy? I mean, you know, I have a hard time controlling my emotions sometimes and I just... I feel you, I feel you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing, Magda. I, um, I grew up very angry. I grew up harboring a lot of hatred, especially towards African people and uh, African men who were our um, oppressors. And I remember in 1982, uh, my brother, when he left the country, he was stationed in Lesotho as a refugee and uh, he got married and had a son, so the son uh, was brought back home to us. So I would take Lungile to his mom in Lesotho. This particular year in 1982, I was around 18 years and uh, we went to Lesotho, Lungile visiting uh, his mother. And uh, we were there the very first day in the evening, we got word that the South African government was going to raid Lesotho. And they raided Lesotho. The South African army came and uh, we had to sleep in the milli fields, in the corn fields, because they knew the houses of the refugees. And it was amazing, I remember Outside in the field, the helicopters, the gunfires, the bombs that were dropped. 
and uh, 42 people died, uh, African National Congress people. And I remember during the funeral, because Maseru uh, Lesotho's capital is a small town, and the mortuaries could not be able to to take care of the bodies, and uh, the infrastructure was not good. The bodies were decomposing. There was smell of these bodies all over. It's amazing how from that, I literally suppressed that feeling. And when I got home, they were just happy for me to be there. And for some reason, uh, no one really asked me how it was or going deep. So I went with that feeling that, or thinking that, that I was healed from that experience, just buried it somewhere. And it's amazing. In 2012, I was working with uh, a mystic, Andrew Harvey, uh, who is, uh, who uses a lot of uh, 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 Buddhist techniques and also a, a, a Sufism. And uh, he was doing what is called Tonglen meditation. And he was taking us through a, a practice of what uh, he called fierce compassion and where he would take you through different steps of having compassion for yourself, those that are close to you and uh, family and, and, and also your enemies. And then when I came to the stage where we had to have compassion for these en enemies, 20 years later, that whole experience of Lesotho came. I literally smelled the decomposing bodies. I literally had the, the bombs, the helicopters, and I went cold. I literally went into shock. And through him working with me, it's amazing what we are capable of. The heart started to open. And I felt after that, the hatred that I had for my oppressors starting Wayne, and not that I was at a stage where I say now I'm gonna let, uh, uh, lie down and be trampled over, but there was this sense of peace. There was this sense of with this hatred, I was in a prison of my own. So that's when I got freed. And here's the thing: guess who are my most clients that I'm coaching in South Africa? African men. And when I coach them. I love them unconditionally. I accept them unconditionally because that's what for me coaching is. So I've, I've learned that from hatred, from seeing the other only in a negative sense does not help us. I believe in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. when he says, only love can drive away hatred. It's only when I cultivated that, that I started to heal myself because Nelson Mandela said that resentment is like drinking poison and hoping that your enemy dies. So I've worked on myself and uh, I'm glad I'm where I am right now with the capacity to open the heart and have an expansive heart that accepts the others unconditionally, that's able to even look and investigate about me. What are some of the parts that those I deem to be perpetrators do I also own? Because we own both sides and it's only when we take those that we are able to be whole and full and free. I am very happy for you that you went through that, uh, the, the, the good part, the putting away of the hatred. But, you know, it's, it took you 20 years. And um, I, I think what I'm really, yeah, what I'm really concerned about is what's been happening to all around the world, frankly, for the past few years, especially. Um, 
And I don't know, every morning I wake up and I feel like there's more hate. I mean, I'm in Chicago and just this morning, um, or sorry, yesterday, excuse me, there was looting just started um, downtown, a hundred people were arrested. And uh, it's like, every time you think something, things are getting better, something happens and you just kind of go, how, how do we fix this? What, what, can we, what can we do? Because clearly there's people who cannot move from that place of hatred to love. Um, and the world's kind of falling apart a little bit right now. I mean, what should we be doing uh, in our communities, in our homes, in our, in our own hearts? Help us. <laughs> It's a difficult one, uh, Magda, and uh, we all are through different journeys. And we reach, I wouldn't say a destination because this journey does not have a destination. In this journey, we somehow um, shed some of the layers that don't serve us. And because we're human, there are some layers that we so much hold tightly to that we don't want to shed. And I don't know, it's, uh, you know, when I practice uh, meditation, compassion, I feel that when we do that, a, a, a sizable, sizable group of people, when we do that, we somehow help to heal the world. Since the lockdown in South Africa, which started uh, on the 26th of March, we formed a sitting meditation compassion practice group that meets daily. We've now been meeting for almost 140 days, every day from 6 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. And I feel true doing that because this group is growing. Now we are 30 something, we started being seven. And through that collective consciousness and sending this positive energy and compassion to the world, bit by bit, people will be healed. Because people, we've been wounded. Those who did the wounding, are also wounded. And I'm wondering what is it that would bring people together and we stop the othering. I thought this pandemic had brought us together because I recognize some forms of compassion, but clearly we're not there. And what I can say, Mark, that those who are practicing those who are mindful, we should continue. Maybe, maybe one day we'll be able to be non-dualistic. We'll be able to be connected and really see all of us as together in this journey to freedom. I hope so too. That dog um, agrees with me as well. <laughs> it, he does, yes. <laughs> my, one of my cats just walked by and meowed at me, so I think he also agrees. <laughs> so the animals are in this. If we can... The animals know what they're doing. It's the humans yeah, that are a problem. If we can just be and bring other human, fellow human beings to see it. Yes. Yeah, it's... It's difficult times we live in um, because we can communicate better. Uh, in many ways, we have many fewer barriers between our neighbors, between different races, different countries, yet somehow with all the advantages that we have, we can't seem to see eye to eye. And um, yeah, I mean, I had to ask you the question because there, you know, there has to be an answer. There has, something has to give for this world to heal because right now it's just not good. Um, meditation maybe is one way of starting that to kind of center yourself, to ground yourself for, for the day. Um, I, 
I actually, I don't practice meditation, but actually I do. And it just made me think of when I, when I take my dog for a walk, that's how I start my day. I mean, I have my breakfast and then, yeah, Sailor and I walk and I try to empty my mind and I'm not, you know, checking my phone or just, just looking at the flowers, just saying hi to the squirrels. Um, and that's kind of my way of centering myself that helps me cope with this. Um, I like what you just said now because uh, most of us think that when you meditate, you need to have your shrai, you need to have your cushion, your zondo. Meditation happens or should happen right throughout. When you're washing dishes, sweeping the floor, and just sitting and breathing, that is enough. But once we think that it's only when you sit down and be serious, you know, assume the lotus position and, you know, the pictures that we see in magazines, no. Just walking, walking and be able to feel your souls touching the soil, touching the ground. Just being able to be with your sensations in your body, just listening to the heartbeat of your heart and listening to these different sounds. And which for me is what even helps me in coaching because I can coach in the, the most noisy environment. And I'm able to tune out all the other noise and be able to just hear the, 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 the person I'm with. And I know other people, they get irritated with, uh, with external noise. Whereas if we can integrate that into who we, we are, listen to those different sounds, listen to what happens to the body, amazing things happen. You get more and more open and uh, your consciousness and awareness rises. I know a lot of people who are going to listen to this are going to be irritated by these birds, these adidas, and the, and the dog. <laughs> and the doggy. <laughs> Maybe even that would be a way, especially if they're interested in what is being said, to tune out all those other sounds. I'd be, I'd be interested to to hear what people's reactions are to all this noise in the environment. Me too. So anyone who's watching this later or listening on our podcast, uh, please leave a comment. On YouTube, you can definitely leave a comment. On podcast, you can't, but you can email us. I, I'd love to know that too, because it is something that I've noticed um, in, my, yeah, in myself and the transformation. It's about focusing on, on the good things and yeah, like accepting your surroundings as a part of you. And uh, one thing that I've realized, you know, when I go to my parents' house and I stay over there, they are kind of in the middle of a forest and it's lovely. And, um, you know, in the evening, you just hear the crickets and um, at night it's pitch black and you don't hear anything if you, when you're in the house. And I, I love it. I love it. I love it. And then initially when I would come back to my house, which I'm in the suburbs, but there's still noises. Um, I would think about, oh yeah, this is not great, blah, blah, blah. But then I'm just like, hold on, I have nature noises here too. So like I would open <laughs> the window and somehow at this point now it's coming to me because all I, what I hear is the crickets and all the insects doing their thing and the skunk who's digging up my tomatoes. Um, uh -huh. But I'm not hearing, you know, the road um, or w whatever else there is. And it's actually having that noise is actually making me more calm and making me sleep better. So I can, I totally understand <laughs> where you're coming from, I think. And it's true the saying that says, uh, awareness follows attention. Mm. What we give attention becomes bigger. Yeah. If you give attention to love, you find more love. And if you give attention to hatred and delusion, that is what you're going to get. So for me, it's, 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 it's like, how do we create what we want? Because energy as well 
follows attention. I love that. We just need to make sure everyone listens to this on the whole planet so they can apply it in their own lives. Wouldn't that be a better world? We'll get there somehow. Ah, we don't know. We don't know because even this pandemic, I think uh, there's something that it's, it's here to teach us. Yeah. And I'm just hoping that we can open our hearts, open our eyes and our ears and really pause to get to that quote by Viktor Frankl that you started off with. My very, very favorite quote. It's beautiful. So Nabantu, speaking of teaching, the other thing that I read about you was that you work with, um, or maybe work, I'm not sure, with UN peacekeepers. Um, how, how is that? Because a lot of what we're, you know, those are people who are in the, the conflict. They are, they're literally in the places where we read about um, in the news. And all these things that we've been talking about, they definitely should <laughs> apply to, you know, to us who are fortunate enough to not be in those positions. But I just, I, I wonder, how, yeah, people who are in the middle of that conflict, whose job it is to be in danger, how would they apply this? Hmm. I, li I like that question because, you know, when I uh, first started uh, working with uh, peacekeepers, I uh, thought uh, these men and women are used to a command and control environment. And my work is mainly based on hard work, is based on mindfulness, is based on really getting in touch with yourself. And people who do that kind of work, who see death, atrocities, life, it's like, hey, what are you talking about? And it's amazing how much true patience, how much true getting through them from the heart, how much not just focusing on technical issues, but on developing self-mastery, on developing emotional resilience, on developing emotional intelligence how you find people starting to open and actually seeing a side that they don't know. I remember I worked in one environment with someone hardcore person who was uh, in the army and uh, this person had been in the army for more than 30 years. And uh, this organization had uh, commissioned me to develop a year program, year-long program that involved uh, leadership development and coaching. And when we started off with this guy, he was so resisting, saying I've been through these uh, leadership development programs all over the world. What you being this African woman, can you help me with? And but you know, that's when I thought, okay, now we're gonna use the command and control environment because you don't have a choice here. You have to go through this program. At the end of the program, this guy came to me crying, saying, thank you, thank you. My daughter and my wife have given me feedback that they never knew that I had a heart. So when now this guy has got a daughter that is like 20 something year old and he's been married for more than 30 years, who see another side that they knew not to exist in him. That is the kind of the work. When you really see the person you're working with, when you really love them unconditionally. I always say when I'm going to coaching, I 
take the experience I had when I first fell in love. You know, those butterflies and you think, okay, now I'm going to meet this person, I'm going to coach. This attention is just going to be 120% yes towards that person. I am with you wholly and I'm not judging you. Unconditional positive regard. <laughs> and I, I, I love that because like you said before, if you focus on that love, good things will come out of it. So that without any doubt. And I know you get to situations where people push back against you and until people experience that, it's difficult to really know that it can exist with the violence, with the atrocities that we're going through in the world. Mm. Nabantu, if there's one thing that people can do after they listen to this or watch this uh, to make the world a better place, to get started on the kind of journey that you've experienced, what is that one thing that people should do? Very simple. Uh, the body has got its intelligence that we have not even started to tap into. And all the trauma, all the feelings that we feel, whether love or whatever, everything is felt in the body. And I think if we can start to get into our bodies, because that's what connects us to the reptilian brain, then we're able to discard of all the traumatic experiences. We're able to be in touch with how it is when I feel this love, what happens to my heart, what happens to my, uh, to my, to, 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 to my tummy, to my belly, what sensation. And if you're thinking about it, indigenous practices, though it's not done as a result of scientific knowledge, we dance a lot as indigenous people. We sing, we dance, we, we just sing and just dance and jumping up and down and get ourselves into a trance. That's exactly getting into that body. And you find, these people are suffering. These people are, are oppressed. Why are they still happy? It's getting the stress out of the body. That's why when we are stressful, we feel that heaviness in our shoulders. We need to get to our bodies. It's as simple as that. Walking, you can even, when you're angry, stamp your feet and then just settle. Feel the vibrations feel the sensations in your body. It's there with us. We don't need to go out and go to a retreat center. So when everyone is done listening or watching, put the phone down, close the computer, go for a walk, dance like no one's watching, and then listen to your crazy song and... and <laughs> Yeah, I, story for a different time, but I've done that plenty too. <laughs> I can totally relate. Yes, it's amazing it's and free. Nice. I know oh, I love dancing. I'll dance my, my, myself till the last day. <laughs> awesome. Into my coffin, dancing. <laughs> and I think your dog agrees again. Because he's barking again. <laughs> This dog knows when to back. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> uh -huh. No, Bantu, um, I really enjoyed learning all these things from you. I actually can't wait to watch this again and um, write down some of the wisdom you've shared today, both yours and from Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King and Viktor Frankl and a whole bunch of others um, because they, they're important. And I think it's nice to have these kind of anchors to go back to when you are feeling disheveled, when you are feeling stressed. It's nice to 
remember that others have done have gone through a lot worse than you and somehow they emerge on the other end and we should really listen to them and learn from them um and then dance to enter to uh <laughs> get over it basically a great dance <laughs> yeah will do Navantu, mm. thank you so much for your time today it was lovely talking to you thank you very much this was just a a nice coffee chat i wish you yeah. were here just you know sharing a cup of tea or a glass of champagne I know. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll have the champagne you can have the tea um <laughs> But thank you everyone for watching and or for thank listening you. if you're on the podcast. It was lovely to have you. And um, please check the episode notes for a link to Nobantu's uh, LinkedIn so you can see all the other great things she's done. And um, she will be speaking at our Awake, Aware, Arise event that is happening in September and October. So I will put a link to that event as well because if anything actually resonates with you in this chat, I think you will enjoy Awake Our Arise because it's, it's all about how do, we, how do we save the world together <laughs> uh, on a personal level, on a community level, at your workplace, um, wherever your universe spans to. Um, so yeah, I hope you join me there and I hope you will listen to Nobantu's talk then. Until then, I will see you all in the same time, same place next Wednesday for Wonder Woman Wednesdays. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>